When you're watching the news, they are the most listening to debates, or scrolling social media, in danger. how often does someone tell you that you should be afraid? Afraid of pandemics? Afraid of terrorists? Afraid of World War III? It's going to be a war like no other. People shouting at you that the end is right around the corner, that our whole way of living is about to change, and we're only a few minutes from midnight. It seems like every global issue is something we need to fear, with climate change being no exception to this. But I mean, shouldn't we be afraid of climate change? What with all the ice sheets melting and oceans rising and air getting hotter, if we keep this up, we're gonna have no planet left in a hundred years. This is gonna lead to the extinction of mankind. Okay, but how much of this are we actually sure of? And how much is just speculation? If people getting freaked out about the climate crisis was an effective solution, then why are we still in this mess? To try and answer this question, we need to first figure out what we are sure of versus what we're predicting, how fear tactics have warped the conversation, and how to move past this to real solutions. Join me for the next 15 minutes as we break down why we shouldn't be afraid of climate change. Before we start thinking about the future, it's important to understand what we've observed from the past to present. As of writing this, the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere is 422 ppm, a 50% increase in concentration since the relatively static pre-industrial levels of the 1700s. A majority of this increase has taken place after 1950. We've also seen the global average temperature increase by over 1 degree Celsius during the same period, with most of the warming occurring in the last 40 years. This is causing the surface ocean to warm, as it absorbs roughly 90% of the excess heat coming from our atmosphere. This warmer air and water is leading to the accelerated melting of ice sheets that are currently losing billions of tons of ice every year. And of course more ice melting from above the land down into the sea is causing the oceans to rise, with sea levels rising 20 centimeters in the last century. I could go on to list more symptoms of climate change, but you get the idea. All of these are objective, empirical measurements confirmed by tens of thousands of international scientists. They all support the same hypothesis, that we are living in a period of unprecedented rapid warming caused by humanity's unchecked combustion of ancient carbon. Now I get that thinking about this can freak people out, but that is not my goal. None of the previous observations are meant to invoke fear, just as the purpose of a doctor's diagnosis is not to make the patient panic. This is the reality of the situation. The Earth is sick, and it's important for us to recognize these symptoms as a consequence of our actions. But how much do we know about what the future of our climate could look like? Our predictions about the climate start way before the days of the IPCC, before the days of James Hansen and Charles Keeling, before the days of computers. One of the first people to predict the impact of carbon emissions was in the year 1856 by a woman named Eunice Newton Foote. In a time when science was dominated by the male population, she ran her own independent experiment to see how sunlight interacts with different gases. Her plan was to take two identical cylinders, fill one with ambient air, fill the other with a different gas, and leave them both out in the sun at the same time, measuring their change in temperature. What she found was that the cylinders with extra water vapor and the cylinders with extra carbon dioxide got much hotter than the ones filled with ambient air. From this, she hypothesized that an atmosphere of that gas would give to our Earth a high temperature, essentially being one of the first to predict the driver of climate change over 150 years ago. Nowadays, our understanding of the greenhouse effect has proven foot correct, leading many to wonder what might happen if our current carbon emissions continue. Starting in the 1960s, things really began to pick up in our understanding of Earth's climate. Satellite observations allowed scientists to look at ice cover, temperatures, and solar radiation on scales never before imaginable. Ice cores drilled from millennia of ancient snow revealed the composition of Earth's atmosphere going back epochs and advancements in computer science ushered in an era of climate models and simulations. These models, which took existing observations and looked at patterns in the data to forecast future outcomes, were used to accurately predict the changes in temperature, ice cover, and sea levels we talked about earlier. For example, a 1972 paper from Dr. J.S. Sawyer predicted that the Earth would warm 0.6 degrees Celsius by the end of the century. The observed temperature increase from 1972 to 2000 was about 0.5 degrees Celsius. 
Private researchers for Exxon accurately predicted temperature increases back in 1977, and even concluded that the poles would warm many times faster than average. A paper from Schneider and Thompson from 1981 made correct assumptions about the increases in warming and heat transfer through the oceans. See where I'm going here? With the amount of observations we had, it became easier and easier to predict basic patterns in Earth's climate. But these predictions for the future were all contingent on one major assumption. How much fossil fuel are we going to burn in the future? Let's face it, you can have a godlike understanding of Earth's present climate down to each molecule of air, but how will that hold up after another decade of burning fossil fuels? To give scientists a standard framework to build their predictions around, the IPCC came up with the idea of Representative Concentration Pathways, or RCPs. These four numbers represent future climate scenarios given humanity's attitude towards carbon emissions. RCP 2.6 assumes that emissions start declining in 2020 and go to zero by 2100. I think we might have missed that train by now. RCP 4.5 has emissions peaking in 2040, RCP 6 has them peak in 2080, and RCP 8.5 is just a full send on burning coal. Each of these comes with their own predictions, but the fact remains, we don't know which of these paths we will go down. Also, you may have noticed as we look further out into the future, our uncertainty grows with it. Will we stabilize emissions on RCP 4.5 and get lucky with only 2.5 degrees Celsius of warming by 2100? Or will we ignore the issue, go down RCP 8.5 and see 7 degrees Celsius of warming over the same time? What happens if you're a researcher and you have to pick one of these RCPs to build your model around? How will the errors and uncertainties of each RCP propagate and compound throughout your model, especially the more complex ones? And what if our carbon emissions follow wildly different patterns than the ones being assumed? What if one year we triple our fracking and then a few years later we ban it entirely? You can see how this easily muddies some of the predictions we might make, regardless of how powerful our models are. Slowly, we leave the realm of empirical observations and enter the realm of speculations. Just to be clear, I am not undermining the value of climate models. Due to advancements in computing and millions more observations, modern models are more accurate than they have ever been in the past. By being able to visualize potential changes before they are already upon us, they can ideally guide policy in constructive ways to help avoid the worst outcomes. But the flip side to this is that some scientists and news media like to focus all of their attention on the most terrifying predictions imaginable. We're going to pass that tipping point in the next few months. They claim that the reason for this is to galvanize climate action by scaring people into making changes. However, it seems more like this cultivation of fear helps to perpetuate the problem more than it actually addresses the root causes of it. So then why are people telling us to be afraid of climate change? Around the year 62 AD, the philosopher Seneca wrote one of many letters to his correspondent Lucilius. In it, Seneca mused on the roots of fear, writing that, There are more things, Lucilius, likely to frighten us than there are to crush us. We suffer more often in imagination than in reality. About 2,000 years later, this sentiment holds true in a number of ways, climate change being just one of them. But why? What is there to gain from continuously frightening people about something they most likely already believe is an issue? To get a clear answer to this question, we must look past the realm of science and the realm of politics to think about the roots of fear itself. Fear is one of the most primal emotions at our arsenal, a protective adaptation to danger in our environment. It is deeply ingrained within us from the moment we can perceive the world and stays with us our whole lives. While fear can be beneficial, for example running away from a snake about to bite you, it also has a tendency to oversimplify things. When you see an angry snake, you don't sit there rubbing your chin contemplating why the snake is there, if it has eaten a full meal recently, or how does the biochemistry of its venom function. You either think kill it or run, the typical adrenaline fueled fight or flight response. This oversimplification and inability to properly rationalize details really shows itself when dealing with issues more complex than a snake. Say for example, some of the world's reactions to the COVID-19 pandemic. A large group of people, let's call them Team Flight, feared the virus itself, leading to some behavioral choices that made no sense from a rational point of view. 
say for example wearing masks and gloves while driving alone in their own car. And then another group of people, call them Team Fight, feared federal intrusion into their lives, causing them to reject rationality in favor of fringe conspiracies. Say, for example, that the whole COVID thing was made up, just so the government can inject us with microchips when they vaccinate us. Both groups boiled the whole pandemic down to either the apocalypse or a global conspiracy, their irrationality slowing the progress of addressing a complex issue by engendering hatred and loathing between the opposing viewpoints. If you're against vaccines, you're an alt-right Nazi. If you're wearing a mask, you're a slave to Fauci. Luckily, COVID was an issue that got less severe as time went on. Climate change is a different story. Today's media has taken a similar stance to the climate crisis as they did to the pandemic. Intentionally or not, they have allowed a fear of climate change to flourish in their headlines, generally leading to two reactions. The first group of people on Team Fight fear a climate doomsday and will fight for whatever it takes to stop carbon emissions as quickly as possible. The second group of people on Team Flight see all this fear-mongering as a means for government to erode the status quo, fearing draconian climate policy and ignoring the actual changing climate. For example, people from Group Fight might think that electric vehicles are a sustainable godsend since they don't burn gasoline or believe carbon credits are a legitimate way to reduce emissions, or think that banning single-use plastics and buying tote bags will mean they're helping the climate. Meanwhile, someone from Group Flight might believe that climate science is all a scam to raise taxes, leading people to believe in misinformed counterculture science, or believing that there is a global elite manipulating all the research and conversation about climate change, or fearing that a call for sustainability is actually a call for a new world order in which we will have 15 minute cities that track our movement and enforce climate lockdowns with mandatory veganism. You get the idea. Fear tricks people into thinking there is an easy fix to any given stressor, sorting us into polarizing houses depending on if we would rather fight or fly. Fear has us spending our energy demonizing the opposition instead of making constructive progress. This is the stance that modern day philosopher Martha Nussbaum has come to when trying to think of reasons why we seem incapable of democratically solving these large collective issues like climate change. Fear has split and stalled discourse on climate change, she would argue, along with nearly all aspects of American politics, allowing the status quo to continue unabated. The very people supporting the fear rhetoric, mainly crony politicians and for-profit media, continue to make money while the climate destabilizes. Fear gets people watching the news, doom scrolling on social media, fighting in the comments section. Engagement makes money, and nothing makes the media money quite like fear. This then leads to the rise of authoritarian or despotic politicians who use this fear to motivate voters into joining their side to fight the big bad evil others while the issues continue to go unaddressed. But Nussbaum and many others argue that this is the exact opposite approach leaders should be taking. Why should voters have to decide between fearing climate doomsday or fearing a dictatorial climate conspiracy? How do we actually move forward? What is the solution to all this fear in modern politics? Okay, I know this probably sounds a little cheesy and naive to some of you, but stay with me. Some of the most successful advances in social well-being came from people setting aside fear tactics and demonizing the others for an attitude of hopeful optimism. Martin Luther King Jr. was one such man, preaching that the path to racial equality must not focus on creating enemies out of those we fear. But how do we apply this mentality to something like climate change? How do we reject the fear we have been conditioned to accept as normal and instead learn to embrace hope in the face of a growing threat? The first step is to reject the idea that we have some sort of time limit to reducing emissions. There are time limits to keeping global average temperatures below a certain threshold, but it doesn't mean it's game over for humanity if we cross 1.5 degrees C of warming. Every bit of progress we make towards sustainability makes the worst case scenario a little less scary moving us further away from RCP 8.5. Don't let anyone convince you that it's too late to save the climate. The time to cut emissions is now, it has always been now, and it will always be now until society is carbon neutral. The second step is to reject the notion that future emissions are inevitable. Our emissions today do not determine our emissions tomorrow. 
We may be currently on track for a certain outcome if nothing changes and we stay perfectly in line with an imagined scenario, but none of this is set in stone. Some years we may slip backwards in our progress and others take big steps forward. The future is not predetermined. The third step is to reject the idea that a secret society of global elites are using climate science and policy as a means to control the population. This conspiratorial mindset stems from fear, not reason, and is an irrational response that gnaws away at constructively hopeful plans for the future. Even if for the sake of argument there is some underground dungeon where evil shape-shifting lizards conspire to ban coal, force us to drive EVs, and rig the World Series, there would still be real tangible benefits for reducing carbon emissions today. No matter who is in charge, burning fossil fuels destabilizes our climate. Ignoring the problem will not make it go away. The last thing we need to accept is that there is no easy solution to climate change. As we said before, fear tends to oversimplify complex issues. Moving past fear to hope for our planet's next few hundred years requires us all to accept the nuance and difficulty of the situation we've been born into. Every bit of coal mining and crumbling infrastructure, every Exxon lobbyist and tree cut down for farmland, every greenwashed advertisement and pundit on both sides of the story. And as Nussbaum would say, we need to see active hope, not passive hope, to address any problem like climate change. This means going to climate-related protests, creating art focused on a sustainable revolution, having conversations with your friends and family about the importance of acting now, thinking critically about consumption habits under our current economic system, developing plans for mitigation, and imagining what a futurist, carbon-neutral world might look like, to name a few. And think, if climate change really forces us all to cooperate, to build a world with less environmental exploitation, a healthy symbiosis with nature, and a sustainable, stable climate? Is that really something to be afraid of? Thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I know this video is a bit different from my typical content, but like everything I upload, I really hope it spoke to you and made you think about climate change with a little less fear. As always, all the sources are linked in the description. If you enjoyed this, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to support Planet Zero. I'll see you next time.